Welcome to this webinar event presented by the SAB and sponsored by AstraZeneca, updates on tissue acquisition and biomarker testing. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items for everyone. You have joined in the listen only mode. Please ask questions throughout using the question feature located on your control panel. We will address any questions you have during and after the lecture. At this time, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Pritchett. Thanks, Emily, and thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, uh, we're proud to do this sponsored uh, webinar with AstraZeneca, um, and uh, this is our SAB Lung Educational Program. Uh, I'm really pleased to have a fantastic panel of speakers tonight, um, uh, not specifically me, but uh, the people who are here with us, Dr. Jeffrey Clark, um, Assistant Professor in um, Thoracic Oncology at Duke University, uh, Dr. Scott Skibo from Duke Life Point Hospital System, who's the Director of Interventional Thoracic Oncology, um, and I'm Michael Pritchett, the current and almost outgoing uh, President of Society for Advanced Bronchoscopy and um, Director of the Chest Center of the Carolinas in um, uh, Pinehurst, North Carolina. So we're excited to talk to you tonight. Uh, some of this information is, is going to be a little basic, but we want to uh, make this information um, applicable to everybody across the spectrum of, of hospitals from academics and community. Uh, and hopefully there'll be something in here for everybody to learn. And, and most importantly, we encourage you to enter your questions in the chat box on the right. You can enter them throughout. And then at the end, we'll have a nice panel discussion where we can open it up and just uh, have a live discussion and answer really any questions that you may have. Um, so with that, again, welcome, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, just to let you know, again, um, uh, these opinions are our opinions. They don't represent uh, AstraZeneca, uh, and uh, they are sponsoring the webinar. But um, again, uh, these opinions are ours from our own clinical practice and, and, um, uh, and the literature. So all right, let's go to the next slide. And um, I'll get my colleagues, they can turn their cameras off so that they can go, you know, have a glass of wine or something like that while, uh, while I'm working. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about screening and diagnosis. And then Dr. Skibo is going to come on. He's going to talk to you about staging of lung cancer. Um, and then it, really probably why you all tuned in uh, is to hear Dr. Clark talk about biomarker testing and management of patients that have uh, metastatic EGFR mutation positive non-small cell lung cancer. And then again, we'll have that uh, hopefully robust Q&A at the end uh, if, if you're able to stay on. And again, we encourage you to submit your questions in that chat box there. So let's talk first about screening and diagnosis, and then I'll hand it over to Dr. Skibo. Um, next slide. So we know that we need a multidisciplinary approach, and that's important to kind of guide patients from having symptoms to screening. Uh, we know that probably the vast majority of patients don't have symptoms, actually, uh, and especially in the lung cancer screening population, they technically can't have uh, symptoms. If they have symptoms, then they just need a regular CAT scan. Uh, if they're asymptomatic, then they qualify for lung cancer screening. So either way, there's, there's multiple ways to get your patients into the system, right? And a lot of this depends on the system that you're at. It may come through a PCP. It may get referred to a multidisciplinary clinic. It may get referred to a thoracic oncologist. Um, believe it or not, there's still some places who, as soon as a PCP sees a lung mass, they send it to the oncologist. Um, the, our oncologists, at least at my site, don't necessarily like that. Um, they want tissue diagnosis before they see them at other sites because we've been, you know, all of the speakers here tonight have been to some of these, you know, round tables and ad boards. And we've actually heard some oncologists in certain systems that say, that's fine. I'll take ownership. I'll order the right type of biopsy, things like that. So, it, you know, all politics are local, right? So all of this is local as well. But we'd really like to do it in a multidisciplinary fashion. So when you have these asymptomatic patients, they may go to their PCP. But remember, pulmonologists are doing lung cancer screening. We've had gynecologists who are doing lung cancer screening. They serve a lot of times as primary care providers for their women patients or their female patients and for women. And they're ordering lung cancer screening, which we love. Um, so either way, then they get into the system um, to one of those specialists. Next slide. So we know that screening works and we know that screening saves lives. 
Um, what we've seen now uh, is unfortunately a very slow uptake, and this is notwithstanding COVID. We know that that's kind of put a damper on a lot of things, um, but it's estimated that about 8 million people uh, meet the criteria for lung cancer screening, but we're only scratching the surface of that with only about 4% of patients. Now, this may vary based on the system that you're in. There's some systems that are doing 10% or 15%. There's some that are doing 1%. So what we like to say is that lung cancer screening is really the rising tide that floats all boats that will generate um, you know, business development, uh, if you're interested in that, which a lot of our SAB members are, uh, for interventional pulmonologists, advanced bronchoscopists, thoracic surgeons, radonc, medonc, that's the rising tide that gets all those people busier and the nice thing is, is that it saves lives. Um, we know that the five-year survival rate for lung cancer is horrible, you know, 19 to 20%. What we saw in the NLST is that about 45% of those patients um, were still alive in five years. So we know we can really double at least that number by just doing lung cancer screening. And uh, in the Nelson trial, we probably got that number even a little bit higher. So we want to encourage lung cancer screening. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll unfortunately not be able to get into specific ways to do that, but really make sure that you're pushing your hospital system to do that. Um, obviously, with COVID, things are in the air. There's been some guidance recently from CHESS that came out in April. That was during what I call the panic phase of COVID. Um, and they came out and they said, hey, yeah, you don't have to do lung cancer screening during this time. Those times for a lot of places are over. But again, all things are local. There's some places um, where they shouldn't be doing lung cancer screening right now. They need to focus on other things. Um, next slide, please. So the one thing that we have to also keep in mind, as much as we talk about screening, um, you know, we can find a lot of stage one lung cancers in the general population, but we can find a lot of stage one lung cancers in the screening population. What this doesn't actually mention is the incidental population, okay? So there's 1.5 million nodules found a year in the US and the vast, vast majority of those are actually incidental nodules. So it behooves you and your program uh, to find a way, look at software programs or whatever to capture those incidentals and make sure that they're not lost. It's estimated that about 30% of lung nodules in a system are just completely lost. And then we see those patients back a year later and they have stage three or stage four. So we know that we can create that stage shift by doing lung cancer screening, but we really wanna harness the power uh, also of capturing incidental nodules. Next slide. Uh, so it, you guys know this, uh, the recommended population for screening uh, is published by the USPSTF, um, 50 to 80, uh, at least 20 pack year history of smoking and have smoked within the last 15 years. You can take that a step further. The NCCN clinical practice guidelines for oncology recommends that it's a category 2A if you're at least over 50, have 20 pack years and you have a risk factor other than secondhand smoke like first degree relative with lung cancer, things like that. So um, whether insurance will pay for those, again, a lot of that is local and depends on local factors, but we really wanna try to broaden this uh, to capture as many people as we can. Next slide. So this is kind of an audience questionnaire poll thing. We're gonna give it a try, but we're not gonna spend too much time because I don't wanna take away time from uh, my colleagues. What percentage of your patients do you think are eligible for lung cancer screening. Uh, go ahead and select one of the following on your screen, and then we'll look at the results. This is overall in your patient population. Um, what percentage of patients do you think are eligible for lung cancer screening? We'll give that about 10 or 15 more seconds, uh, and then we'll see what kind of response we got and if this thing is working. All right, Emily, why don't you go ahead and show us the results? Hopefully we'll be able to see those. All right, so the good thing is, is that everybody acknowledges that it's not less than, you know, that's not 4%. So we know that probably a significantly higher number of patients are eligible for lung cancer screening, and that's absolutely correct. Uh, next slide. All right, so 
I've talked about this before, multidisciplinary program is important, both on a local level at your hospital. So we want you to have a multidisciplinary conference at your hospital with all of these members, but also we wanna do it more on a societal level too. And that's what we think of as the Society for Advanced Bronchoscopy, doing these multi-center and multi-society guidelines. And we wanna help um, that. And that's some of the initiatives that we're gonna be putting forward here in the next year in terms of um, you know, some, uh, training uh, for hospitals and for programs to institute these uh, guidelines in multi-society and multidisciplinary uh, interactions. Next slide. So lastly, I'm gonna leave you with this before I turn it over to Dr. Skibo. This is the Fleischer Society guidelines. This is actually the guidelines for um, incidental lung nodules, okay? We use the LungRAD score, which is based on Fleischner uh, for uh, screen detected nodules. Uh, but keep in mind, the vast majority of nodules are actually incidental nodules, and we use very similar numbers, um, and we assign LungRADs for that. Um, so this isn't perfect, and PET scans aren't perfect. We know that you have a false negative rate with PET scans, anywhere between 10 to 20%. We're, we're lucky to have some new adjuncts coming down the pipe, like uh, you know, Notify and things like that, which is a blood test, um, which can help you triage these patients. Or if you do a bronchoscopy and you get a non-diagnostic result, you can use things like Veristite. Um, and so we have more and more adjuncts to try to help us make a decision and prioritize, because as much as we wanna catch lung cancer early, we also want to not do invasive procedures on people who are more likely to have benign disease. So we're, we're looking at those things. And keep in mind that, you know, we wanna catch things at stage one, but we actually would like to catch them at stage 1A. And when we have new technologies out there like robotics and comb beam CT and things like that, we now have ways to confidently get very small lesions. And so we want to push that envelope too. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop and I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Skibo on the next slide. And, uh, and again, please submit your questions and we'll get them all at the end. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Bridget. That was excellent. Yeah, and uh, the, the one uh, point of difference I'd make with you is, uh, and you've actually made this point, is the incidental nodule program is the the tide that rises all ships. Uh, you know, it's uh, you know, if you look at um, like the system I'm in, uh, system wide, we've now identified over thirty five thousand incidental nodules um, since we implemented software in all of our hospitals. So it is a tremendous amount of uh, nodules that are found in. And so, um, with that being said, um, I'm going to move into um, the staging process, right? Because I think the most important thing in lung cancer. Um, of course, I'm a pulmonologist, so this is <laughs> skewed from my viewpoint, is a, appropriately staging a patient. And unless a patient is appropriately staged, they cannot receive appropriate treatment. You know, there are things that go into figuring out who gets what treatment and who's eligible for what and what stage they're at. So when I finished my fellowship in 2004, the only thing a pulmonologist is really good for at that time was providing pulmonary function testing. Um, to help the surgeon determine if there's a surgical candidate. Um, our bronchoscopic abilities, uh, eBus was just coming to be at that time, and navigational bronchoscopy certainly wasn't uh, ready for prime time, at least uh, not that I was aware of or involved in. Um, imaging modalities, of course, the non-invasive, but then the, this, the key part is pathologic evaluation. And I'm gonna make this point and I'll make it again. There is no substitute for pathologic evaluation um, of the mediastinum in particular when staging these patients. Next slide, please. So the staging guidelines um, have shipped. You know, this is nothing new from the seventh to the eighth. It's now a couple years old. Um, you know, and the, the reason why um, this eighth edition came out is it was really um, a retrospective and prospective review of 35 different databases, the ISLAC databases, the multinational databases, to try to find better cut points as far as survivals and five-year survivals. So, you know, certain things have happened like T2B is now T3 and T3 is now T4 and now there's a, a 3B and a 3C um, category. But one of the, I think the um, very interesting things that I think is important to this talk is um, stage one. So you see that now the T1 lesions are divided into T1A, T1B and T1C. And so if it's N0, you got 1A1, 1A2, 1A3. 
Why I think that's important is because, as you can see, it's less than a centimeter, one to two centimeters, two to three centimeters. But why I think that's important is those same ISLAC databases that looked at survival um, in these databases from 1999 to 2010 show that if you have a, a 1A1, if that's your stage, you have a 91% five-year survival. If you are 1A2, you're 84%, 1A3, 79%. So the million dollar question is, well, these are all small things that should be curable cancer through surgery, SBRT perhaps, but it should be curable. And I think the answer to that is occult mediastinal disease. And we can go back in the literature, um, the Journal of Thoracic um, Oncology in 2014 kind of published positive mediastinal rates. So in a normal mediastinum based on nodule size. So if it's zero to one, you know, you only have about a one in 50 chance of finding the cult mediastinal disease. However, once you hit a centimeter to two centimeters, you go to 10 to 16%. So right then and there, and if you look at the NCCN, NCCN guidelines, which we're gonna see in a few slides, it doesn't necessarily recommend that you do an EBUS in those patients. You can send them directly to surgery. And if the surgeon's doing a good lymphadenectomy, okay, that's okay but 10 to 16% of those patients are gonna be sent to surgery and upstage during surgery. And then once you get to 20 to 30 millimeters, you're at 29 to 47% incidence of occult mediastinal disease. And we knew that, that was published in 2014. Um, next slide, please. So um, looking at um, basically the important take home message on the slide is this. Number one, a PET scan, as we all know, is not perfect. But what we're seeing across the country is a lot of people are still getting staged non-invasively with a CT scan and a PET scan. You have a two, two and a half centimeter nodule, the CT scan, the mediastinum looks normal, the PET scan, nothing else lights up except for the nodule. That's how the, the patients can be staged. However, uh, it's well known that it can understage people by 20% uh, and overstage by 15%, whereas EBOS or video mediastinoscopy are much better sensitivity and specificity. Now, one of the real take home messages here is the accuracy agreement between clinical invasive stages only about 50%. So a flip of a coin, whether that's going to be um, accurate or not. So the, the wrong answer is always if you're in a tumor board, if someone says, well, do we need to do an EBUS bronchoscopy? The wrong answer is no, the right answer is yes. Somebody needs to explore the mediastinum and as surgeons are doing less and less mediastinoscopy, um, Oftentimes, the answer is a pulmonologist or an interventional pulmonologist doing an EBUS bronchoscopy. Next uh, slide, please. So, taking a thoughtful approach to what um, nodes are, what, what lymph nodes are going to be sampled is important depending on where the primary tumor is. The one panel I want to point out is the right upper lobe. One of the things that we see very rarely, I think, across the United States and probably the world, but I'm going to say the United States, is very few lymph node station twos ever get sampled. That is one of the most frequent positive stations um, in a right upper lobe tumor. So it's, a, it's incumbent upon the EBUS bronchoscopist to make sure they're going after station two, four, and then do a thorough, um, you know, seven in the contralateral nodes. Um, next slide, please. So this is that um, flow diagram that I alluded to, the NCCN guidelines for the um, lymph node staging in non-small cell lung carcinoma. So if you look over on the left of that slide, um, it says, all right, well, if the mediastinal um, does not look, the mediastinum does not look suspicious, all right? And, um, you know, it's a clinical N0 disease, uh, peripheral tumor or tumors less than two centimeters, you can go all the way down to the bottom and say, send this to a surgeon resection with lymph node dissection. And that is certainly not wrong. However, we're seeing in the, um, I think in the, um, the the cancer community, we're seeing that answer less and less be the right answer. I know where I work, the uh, thoracic surgeons are always wanting the EBUS bronchoscopy prior to surgery. And I showed you that data where you know, 10 to, you know, you have 10 to 20 millimeter nodule and it's 10 to 16% occult mediastinal disease. So it doesn't take very many patients to start finding occult mediastinal disease or occult N2 disease, um, you know, and then you just save the person a surgery. Um, now, if you have the mediastinum that looks suspicious, 
Of course, you're going to start with uh, EBUS bronchoscopy staged that way. If the lymph nodes are positive, they go on to multimodality therapy. If they're negative, though, that's where I think we as pulmonologists can get better at EBUS bronchoscopy because it turns out a negative EBUS bronchoscopy, you have to do 10 mediastinoscopies to find one false negative EBUS bronchoscopy. So that's a lot of mediastinoscopies. And the problem with that is, Less and less surgeons are doing mediastinoscopy on a regular basis. So I think as a society, one of our goals should be um, to, to make sure that we are um, forming a registry and looking at lymph nodes to predict whether they're truly negative or falsely, likely falsely negative. So things like the size, shape, echogenicity, central presence of a central hilar structure, um, uh, coagulation, necrosis sign, vascularity of the lymph node, all those things are well documented in the literature as far as things that can predict whether it's going to be a true negative or a, pulse neg or a false negative. Uh, next slide, please. And, um, you know, as, as then as you're... Um, you know, presenting the patient in the lung tumor conference, and this is, um, you know, most of our time as everyone's time is spent with stage three patients, right? And we're always looking at patient characteristics, of course, and we all know that, um, but the node involvement. So thinking about what a, and I'm not a surgeon, you know, I'm a pulmonologist, but, you know, talking to surgeons and what the literature would state and what they're looking for, because it turns out even 3A cancer, which we all learned in medical school, hey, well, that's resectable stage three cancer, right? Well, it turns out that 80% of stage 3As do not get resected. And what's the surgeon looking at as far as determining whether they could be resected besides the performance status and the medical history of the patient? Well, they're looking at the nodes. Are they bulky? If they're greater than two centimeters, that's a red flag. If the tumors are spread beyond the nodal capsule, red flag, patients do poorly if they go to surgery. And then multi-station N2 disease. And that's why it's really important in that right upper lobe to go after station two and four, because if the surgeon knows both of those are positive, they may say, I don't know if I'm going to take this patient, um, you know, to surgery, right? And um, so it's important that these patients are adequately staged um, with EBUS bronchoscopy. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide as I segue into the main show that's coming up in just a second here. Um, you know, so uh, unfortunately, most of our patients across the country are diagnosed at either stage three or four. Those of us that have robust lung cancer screening, incidental nodule programs, we have seen a stage shift. Um, and certainly we recognize that here at my institution. And I know the people on the, uh, the other panelists have also uh, recognized this because of those programs. Um, but our goal is, of course, to find more and more early lung cancers and um, where, uh, you know, cure is the um, rule rather than the exception. Um, um, with that being said, I'm going to now pass it over uh, to Dr. Clark, who is uh, has the lion's share of the work here tonight. Uh, Pritchett and I got off easy with this, and I'm going to sit back and listen to, to you teach us, Dr. Clark. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Skibo. You guys are hard to follow. Um, there's a great uh, lead in. I would have to agree with you that staging is the most important um, component uh, when approaching a, a new lung cancer diagnosis. Uh, I would say that a very, very close second though now is biomarker testing. I spend a significant portion of my uh, day and uh, time with patients going over biomarker acquisition, interpretation, and ultimately um, uh, utilizing those results to pick the best treatment for patients. And so my hope over the next handful of slides is to um, help uh, show you why this is so important um, and, and also hopefully highlight some areas where there's opportunities at your own institutions to uh, work with your colleagues and help um, optimize uh, your uh, tissue handling and biomarker um, uh, testing strategies. So uh, next slide. So as uh, we all know, and as we've talked about so far, uh, you know, lung cancer is absolutely a team sport where we need effective communication more than ever uh, between interventionalists, um, oncologists like myself, now pathologists, and even um, you know, even outside vendors uh, to uh, effectively approach uh, cancer patients and, and um, 
acquire all the information that's needed to give them the best treatment possible. The goal of, of this um, coordination of care in a, a multidisciplinary um, manner, it, from my perspective, is to um, maximize efficiency, uh, maximize tissue preservation, and minimize turnaround uh, time for uh, testing results for, for uh, acquiring biomarkers. Um, so having a coordinated uh, multidisciplinary approach to this is, from my perspective, uh, critical. There's multiple ways to do this, and I'm, I'm sure that um, many of you or all of you are, are involved at your, your institutions in, in, um, in, and there's different ways to, uh, that, that you may do this relative to, uh, to your other colleagues outside at other institutions. Um, but the important point from my perspective is that there is um, uh, a good, robust communication um, between the providers and critical elements in this chain. And uh, there is uh, uh, where, in, in areas where you can maximize efficiency, maximize tissue preservation, and again, minimize that turnaround time uh, that, that uh, strategies are optimized to do that. Um, next slide. So um, I, as a medical oncologist, what I'm worried about is ultimately not picking the right um, therapy for, for my patient. And when you look at all of the, um, this is now uh, well documented in, in many different settings, but when you look at uh, patients, um, there, are, there are multiple different uh, steps where there is uh, an opportunity or there's a, uh, a, a chance of not uh, getting the right test done, there's a chance of not getting the right result or interpreting interpreting the right uh, the information correctly, and ultimately not pairing the right uh, therapy for your your patient. So there's this um, diminishing number of patients who ultimately uh, will get the uh, potentially the the right um, uh, therapy chosen for them. And this is really what I worry about most uh, when I when I when I'm approaching a new patient or or uh, thinking about a biopsy or, or ordering uh, genetic testing on, on a patient. And so this is one example looking at EGFR specifically where you can see that there's, again, this diminishing number of patients. There's patients who don't get a biopsy, patients who don't have the right testing that's done, or uh, they're potentially started on treatment before they have the testing results back. And so there's uh, 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 situations here where the right treatment is not ultimately uh, reaching the patient. Um, next slide. Uh, this is all the more important, uh, especially today, because we know that lung cancer is not a one-size-fits-all disease anymore. We've moved uh, over the past two decades now away from this histology-based thinking about lung cancer as non-small cell lung cancer or adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma. We, we now think of um, lung cancer at the molecular level. And when I'm thinking about a patient's tumor, I'm, I'm thinking about the molecular characteristics and what bucket their tumor is going to fall in relative to, um, you know, for instance, a driver mutation. And so um, uh, one of the important points from this slide is that the majority of our patients will have some identified actionable driver alteration that's going to uh, shape their uh, cancer treatment. Um, and again, so we're, we're, we've evolved as a field, um, as, as many of you know, but we no longer think at the bedside of, uh, of uh, lung cancer at, at the, um, as a one-size-fits-all or, or uh, by his, even the histologic subtype. We're thinking at the molecular level now. Next slide. Um, so this is a busy slide, um, but the point being here is that this is, these are just our uh, frontline um, I, I would say frontline paths for treatment for our patients. Uh, these are, are not even frontline uh, options. These are our paths where if we know a patient has a particular driver mutation or if we don't see one, they uh, would, would fall into one of these uh, categories and, and ultimately head down a path with certain, um, sometimes multiple um, different uh, therapies. Uh, for them. And this has evolved outside of uh, just EGFR or even ALK. We now have um, targeted therapies now for, you know, RET, MEDEX on 14, NTREC, BRAF, uh, ROS, 
and so this um, this has even per, uh, particularly evolved rapidly in the past six months, which is fantastic for our patients. But it really drives home the point that uh, we need to have this information in order to pick the best treatment for our patients up front. And again, um, the answer uh, to you know what's the best line, uh, best frontline treatment for for patients today is no longer just a platinum doublet or just chemotherapy. We now have all these nuanced uh, baskets um, and, and paths for our patients to potentially head down based on their molecular uh, testing results and biomarker results. Next slide. So again, this is a, a bit more simplistic, but when I'm approaching a new uh, patient. Um, you know, establishing the histology, establishing, establishing the stage is certainly uh, important, but we're rapidly moving past that uh, in thinking about what biomarker testing has been done, what are the results, um, do I see a clear actionable driver mutation or not, what is the PDL1 uh, expression. Um, in general, if we see an actionable driver mutation, that is our uh, preferred um, therapy for those for those patients. If we don't see it, um, there's a, a patients head down a, a, a different path, typically of, of either um, immune therapy or chemotherapy and immune therapy. Additionally, if the, in that path, if I'm not seeing an actionable um, uh, driver mutation, I, I will immediately think back to what biopsy was done, what was the genotyping done, what is my level of confidence in the result that was um, uh, in the result that was obtained. We'll, we'll talk more about this here in, in a moment, but um, this in general is how I'm approaching a, a new uh, lung cancer diagnosis. Next uh, slide. Um, so to uh, kind of hit home the, uh, why is this so important uh, in addition to selecting the treatment, uh, this type of data is alarming to me as a medical oncologist. It, uh, if you look at the graph on the on the left, it tells us that the majority of our patients are getting one line of, of treatment and only a minority of patients are getting um, uh, multiple lines of treatment. Um, so it tells us that we have, you know, really one shot to get this right for the majority of our, our patients or, um, you know, and in in that the majority of our patients are, are um, not going to make it onto the, that next line uh, therapy. In addition, if you look at the uh, graph on the right, it's, it's really concerning that, you know, based on this data, a, a large portion of our patients are not necessarily getting guideline-based uh, treatment options. So we, uh, you know, we have one shot to get this right and we need to pick the best treatment for our patients. Next slide. So as a thoracic oncologist, this is uh, my favorite slide. Um, I've been showing this slide, I think since 2014 when it first came out, but this was a, a really a, a wonderful say when they where they looked at patients who had a driver mutation and looked at uh, patients who received a targeted therapy against that driver mutation versus ones who did not receive a targeted therapy against that driver mutation. When you look at the, those patients who received an appropriate uh, targeted therapy for their driver mutation, they lived a lot longer than those who did not. So uh, this. Uh, um, you know, is, is wonderful data telling us that if we pick, if, if um, we have to pick and match the right uh, targeted therapy to the right patient, and uh, we can see, um, you know, much improved outcomes. This, there's uh, been more recent data that's more contemporary in the past year or two, um, it, you know, showing this uh, again, um, and, and, it, and it, it shows us that Again, if we if we understand the bio, the molecular biology of the tumor and pick the right targeted therapy, uh, we will improve survival for our patients. Next slide. So um, one strategy that has been used um, increasingly in the past uh, five years or so has been um, that of uh, liquid biopsy or uh, plasma genotyping. I tend to use the plasma genotyping word, but in the, in the press and what your patients often ask obviously is around liquid biopsy. So this is around using, um, uh, it can be done in a couple of different ways, but using sequencing on uh, plasma to detect cell-free DNA from the tumor. And um, it uh, is, there's now multiple vendors that offer this, and it, it is a very valuable uh, tool uh, when approaching um, 
you know, uh, lung cancer in, in general. Oftentimes, and where it's um, most heavily utilized is where there's a scant uh, biopsy or you have difficulty obtaining, um, you know, enough tumor for uh, um, that's adequate for, for genotyping. Um, Oftentimes, when uh, we, uh, if if you, so there's there's really two kind of important points to understand about uh, plasma-based genotyping. One is that there is a um, high degree of specificity. So if you see a driver mutation in a plasma genotyping um, result, it is uh, arguably uh, there in driving the tumor and actionable. Um, conversely, though, if you uh, do not see one, there's a lower sensitivity that, that does vary based on patient characteristics, a lower sensitivity. Um, and if you do not see a driver mutation, it does not mean it's not there. So what does that mean? It means that if you send off plasma genotyping um, and you don't see a driver mutation, you're really obligated to at least consider um, biopsying the tumor or doing some tissue-based uh, genotyping. There's obviously many patient-specific nuances to that um, kind of reflex tissue-based testing, but it is a very important consideration that if you don't see it in the plasma, you should really be also looking in the uh, tissue. Additionally, it has become clear over the past actually probably three or four years now that these are complementary. So there are um, uh, results that the tissue-based testing may not uh, show that the plasma would and vice versa. Uh, next slide. This was beautifully uh, illustrated um, over a year ago now by the uh, group at Penn, uh, where they looked at patients with new diagnosis of, of lung cancer and, and uh, looked at patients who had had plasma genotyping alone, tissue-based genotyping, or both. And when they looked at patients who had both, it resulted in an increased um, rate of identifying actionable uh, alterations in their tumor. So this is um, really uh, illustrating nicely that these are complementary uh, tests. Um, how to use them um, either at the same time or sequentially um, is, uh, I would say, controversial, and I, I'm hopefully we'll have a chance to discuss um, uh, as a group. Um, I, I can tell you the way that I do it, and, and I'm, I'm, I know that uh, Dr. Skibo and Dr. Pritchett uh, probably do things uh, differently. Uh, but this is it's a, nonetheless a really important point to at least acknowledge and, and understand uh, so that we're identifying those driver alterations for our, for our patients. Next slide. Um, one last example as far as uh, trying to illustrate the point as far as why this is important. Um, if you uh, look specifically at EGFR driven uh, lung cancer, a large portion of these patients are going to have PDL1 positive uh, tumors. Um, and so you can imagine a scenario where if you biopsied a tumor and saw that it was PDL1 positive, uh, you might be inclined to offer that patient immediately some sort of immune therapy or chemotherapy and, and immune therapy. Um, uh, if the patient had an underlying EGFR mutation, that would arguably be a um, you know harmful therapy for them. Um, where where we know that actually patients who don't get a targeted therapy frontline can do worse and have uh, uh, increased side effects. Um, uh, if they receive, you know, an immune therapy-based regimen. So this is, um, again, trying to illustrate the point that we uh, want to fully understand every patient's uh, tumor to the best that we can, and you don't want to skip steps and jump over genotyping, for instance, and go straight to the, uh, to the pdl one testing and, and uh, immune therapy because that's you know, where the commercials are or things like, or that's what your patient's asking about. Testing for things like EGFR and, and all the other driver mutations is really uh, critical. Uh, next slide. And so I, again, the, this is uh, to kind of reiterate that point, as a medical oncologist, my um, typical dogma when approaching a metastatic um, lung cancer patients is that for the most part, uh, driver uh, targeted therapies work best in the frontline setting, meaning that there's better outcomes, there's improved toxicity profiles, and uh, not to mention um, uh, you know, patient quality of life and satisfaction. They're able to take a pill rather than um, get intravenous therapy. And so um, 
again, trying to make sure that we fully uh, understand the, the biology of the tumor, whether or not there's a driver mutation there, um, and uh, is, is critically important in, in selecting the best treatment for our patients. And again, we, um, we, we, we know that if you um, uh, skip that step, uh, there can be potential harm for the patients where they don't do as well and there's increased side effects. And so, uh, again, all, you know, it's, it's quite important to, um, uh, you know, pick the best therapy for our patients first. Uh, next slide. Okay, so, so that's all I have. I think we're finishing pretty close to uh, time. Um, and let me turn things over to our, uh, our colleagues here. I'm sure there's, there's lots of, to talk about. Um, and so hopefully some questions have come in. Yes, we have had some questions. Um, and so thanks so much, uh, Dr. Clark. Um, so a lot of the questions we have coming in are kind of revolving around, you know, liquid biopsy. Um, and, uh, but we also have some other questions that, that we get frequently asked uh, in these ad boards that we're frequently in together. And so one of them is, whose job is it? Whose responsibility is it to order molecular testing? I'll let you start, and then we'll see what Dr. Skibo's answer is. Um, that's a great question. I would say uh, it, it's the job. Um, I would say that the answer is whatever is best for the patient. And it, uh, without trying to skirt um, around too much the answer here, um, I, I think that's it's true. It's going to vary by institution. I can tell you that at, at Duke, um, within our group, the medical oncologists like to order the genotyping. Um, and I know that 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 probably has some um, drawbacks to it. And I know that other places are probably more efficient and um, when it's the interventionalist. Yeah, so Dr. Skiba, what what's your experience? You're at a community center, whereas Dr. Clark is at you know a major academic medical center. Um, what are things like for you? So I would uh, differ just a little bit. And I think the um, one of the main roles of a pulmonologist, the value of a pulmonologist on a on lung cancer team is acquiring the data. And I'm, uh, I think um, blood-based genomic testing plays a very large role in um, identifying these patients. And I think maybe part of the key to avoiding losing some of these patients because it, it takes so long for some of this testing to come back. Uh, so in our institution, we use biodesics. And one of the key reasons we use that is a three-day turnaround, and we're happy with the performance characteristics of this test. Um, so the way that our, our practice would work is we see patients Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday with the procedure on Thursday. Um, by the, If I see them Monday, I'll draw that blood in the clinic if it looks like it's an advanced um, lung cancer. And then if the appropriate diagnosis is obtained with on-site, like a non-small cell, they'll release the data that day. So oftentimes at our multidisciplinary meeting, which is Thursday afternoon, I can present the on-site pathology, the initial blood-based genomic testing, as well as hopefully get them teed up with the rest of the stuff. And then the other thing that I'm uh, become more aware of, too, is the concept of tumor shedding. Um, and and the, and the tumors that are shed are potentially the metastatic clones. So it's not that one thing is missing something and the other thing is is finding something. Um, it's that maybe they're telling us a little bit of different information and maybe the stuff that's floating around in the bloodstream might be, um, there's some speculation that that might be the important stuff to know about anyway. Um, so I'm a, I actually become a, um, a bigger and bigger fan of the blood-based genomic testing. Um, personally, and I think, but I think they definitely both play a role, and re we reflex the tissue immediately if it comes back wild type. Dr. Yeah, Pritchett, so, what do you think? Yeah, I, I'll kind of answer for us. We use kind of a, a hybrid approach of, of both of those things, and I think the key thing is, is as I was kind of mentioning before, is, you know, this is all local. It's important uh, to just figure out what works best for your institution and your patients. Um, there are some centers where um, the pulmonologist or, you know, we get labeled as the tissue takers, um, you know, have a responsibility for this or want the responsibility for this and can speed things up a little bit. There's others where there's reflex testing. 100% of adenocarcinomas just get reflex tested. And that's a lot of times at, at academic centers. Uh, we like the three-day turnaround time uh, with biodesics. We also use um, in Nevada, which is now the neogenomics platform, there's Gardens and Foundation has liquid. Um, 
I think the key thing is that Dr. Clark had pointed out is that if there's no mutation on your liquid, it doesn't necessarily mean there's no mutation. I would follow that up with tissue um, if, if it's reasonable and if you have enough tissue. Sometimes we'd like to do that because it, as much as we'd like to think we can always get as much tissue as we want, we can't. So a lot of this should be based on, you know, every hospital I think should know what your Q&S is. Um, what, is what is your percentage of tests that you send off that are quantity not sufficient? And if it's pretty high, then you need to investigate where, where the errors are coming from or maybe augment your testing with simultaneous uh, liquid and, and tissue uh, together. And there seems to be a lot of push for that. I know there's maybe some reimbursement issues. Um, I, I want to get to a, another question. We have several actually. Here's a question for Dr. Clark, which I think is a very good question. Um, and I hope I know his answer. Um, what first line therapy would you give a symptomatic patient when their PDL1 comes back above 50 and you don't have biomarker results back yet? Uh, great, great question. An important one for, for oncologists, and I, this is something I talk to my fellows about as well. In that scenario, which does happen, um, I, I would give chemotherapy alone, uh, giving uh, and allow more time to get the biomarker testing back before I would add in the immune therapy. Um, there are we, um, multiple reasons for that, um, but but in, in short, um, you know, I, I would be worried about giving someone immune therapy and, and them ending up, for instance, with an EGFR mutation where, where that there's actual an interaction between uh, the two that can be problematic and even harmful for the patient. Yeah, and I, I think a couple of years ago, there was a small study in JTO that, that had EGFR patients go on immunotherapy and there was a 0% response rate. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, yeah. um, yeah, you know, with with many of our uh, driver mutation uh, positive tumors, uh, there is definitely a decreased efficacy to immune therapy. Uh, there's many nuances to that, uh, but in, in general, across the board, that's what we uh, see, um, particularly for non-KRAS uh, driver mutations. Yeah. So another question coming in is also a key one, uh, which is, what are some of the best practices to ensure effective communication among the multidisciplinary team, particularly when members may practice at different locations? Um, Dr. Skibo, how, how do you guys do that there and, and coordinate throughout your system? Well, two things really. Number one is a multidisciplinary meeting every week, right? So that's that's number one. And then the second thing is um, a navigator. So a navigator is kind of the thing that glues everything together and ensures patients and information gets from point A to point B and back to point A. Um, so I, it really it's, it revolves around those things. But so many decisions are made at our multidisciplinary meeting, um, and that's where a, a treatment plan is really put forth uh, by the whole team. Yeah, I would say at our institution, there's a couple of things that have really helped us with communication. Number one is the same same thing, weekly multidisciplinary conference. Two is our nurse navigator that is like the tie that binds everything. And we also have a secure messaging system. We've used this Cortex app and now we're using some Epic chat and things like that. But a private and HIPAA compliant way where you can shoot a message to somebody, I can shoot it to my pathologist. Hey, did this come back? Hey, I need to send this off for molecular or whatever, where all the people can communicate and not have to, oh, I got to call Dr. Clark's office and I may or may not get through to him and, you know, or rely on faxes and things like that. So just making communication easier um, is, is what we like to use. How about you, Dr. Clark? So to echo that, I um, both things are fantastic. So new patient coordinators and patient navigators, absolutely critical in making sure that that check boxes checked around, um, you know, genotyping uh, done or pending or resulted. And uh, I would echo uh, both of you as far as good old just communication between interventionalist and, you know, end user, uh, as far as, um, you know, this, you know, biopsy done on this patient today, coming your way, here's, um, you know, what do you want me to send? And just having that streamlined as much as possible. Yeah, great. Um, I'm going to ask this one to Dr. Skibo. Do you notice a difference in the quantity of tissue obtained uh, when you're using a fine needle biopsy versus a 19 gauge FNA? Um, and does this change your decision making and your treatment? Um, you know, particularly CT got a needle biopsy versus bronchoscopy. And, you know, you've got big needles like that for bronchoscopy too, right? Do you, do you see a difference in the, the tissue quantity? 
Well, the I think the main advantage of bronchoscopy versus a percutaneous approach is just the amount of samples you can take. So you can repeatedly go back until you are holding up the cup next to your cytotech or your pathologist, who's ever in the room with you, and they've looked at slides and they see the cellularity of the slide and they could say, yeah, hey, I think you're pretty good. And then I usually take one more sample just to make sure, you know, because um, I don't trust them. Actually, no, I'm just kidding. I do. But um but uh, so I think that's the real advantage of a bronchoscopic approach, other than being able to diagnose the stage in one procedure, you know, but just safely, repeatedly going after uh, biopsy versus um, puncturing the pleura to do so. Yeah, I think that when, you know, when you do a percutaneous biopsy, they're very hesitant to take any more than three, maybe four passes. Um, having rapid onsite pathology that will give you that kind of feedback, hey, there's abundant cellularity, like two more passes and we're good, or this is all necrotic, you don't have any chance of getting this. So so we've instituted that and when, you know, having that rapid onsite, that helps me. Like I had one today, it was mostly necrotic, there was enough to call it cancer. I ordered liquid on that patient that day so that the remaining tissue can be used for PDL one uh, We try to, you know, practice tissue stewardship and not over IHC this stuff to death and really, you know, highlight that. But um, the only thing I would say is that there are some studies, and this is kind of perfect to, to segue into Dr. Clark, there are some studies that require a core needle biopsy still, even though there's been studies that show we can get just as much sample and you can do everything the same. And we even have 18 gauge needles, 18, 19 gauge needles that we can use through a bronchoscope, um, but they don't necessarily qualify as core needle biopsies. What do you think of that, Dr. Clark? You took the words right out of my mouth. So, um, you know, we're we're spoiled here. I think from our uh, interventional pulmonologists, they they um, I believe uh, pretty much uh, routinely use 19 gauge needles. There, for many of our clinical trials, they are stuck in this uh, mindset of that, you know, they need a core needle biopsy in order to get onto a study, which uh, at least at our institution, the, the 19 gauge qualifies. So, um, you know, I, I think that there that is a um, definitely an added benefit that, that you point out for, for many of our patients that, uh, you know, they could potentially be eligible for, for certain clinical trials. Okay. Um, and so I'm getting kind of a follow-up clarification there that they were talking about EBUS needles. Um, I, I mean, we've seen in our literature, and Dr. Skibo, you can jump in on this as well, that there's really no difference between, a, I actually use a 25 gauge needle, believe it or not, for my EBUS and I have an incredibly low uh, QNS uh, rate. Um, so it, I'd save the 19 gauge needle in those cases for sarcoid, lymphoma. We have newer tools now where we can actually put these tiny little forceps through a hole and into the lymph node and take biopsies of that, called Cordyx or spy bites, things like that. Um, but it, I, I don't know what your experience is, but the data would suggest there's really not a big difference. Uh, Dr. Skibo, what do you think? I agree completely with that. Um, you know, I will routinely use 21 or smaller, and uh, we very uh, seldomly get QNS, um, you know. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm not a big fan of, um, uh, you know, the 19 on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, so there's a question which is becoming a very popular one. We touched on a little bit, and I'll ask this one for Dr. Clark. Do you routinely order concurrent tissue and plasma for biomarking, or do you reflex the plasma only if your tissue's negative. That's how the question reads. I, I don't know if that's what they meant, Let, but. I'll tell you what I would love to do and what I do. Um, so <laughs> I would love to just order both on every patient every time. Um, I, uh, I This varies between institutions, between providers. My own personal uh, approach is, is uh, a sequential one where I start with, if I have a chunk of tumor, that gets sent out. And if it's um, uh, and then if I, if I don't, then I would send the plasma. And if that's negative, then I would reflex to, to tumor. Um, but I fully acknowledge and have for many years that these are entirely complementary. I would love to send both at the same time. I would love to see our guidelines, our societies push for this, uh, push payers to reimburse for this. I think this is a major issue where we know that patients are getting um, their, their driver mutations are getting missed. Uh, because we're not able to send both. Yeah, and, and actionable driver mutations are yeah. getting missed. Um, so speaking of that, and, and we'll hopefully get some different answers for this one, but 
for both of you, what kind of challenges are you facing in getting biomarker testing on eligible patients? Are you running into any roadblocks, whether it's tissue amount or reimbursement or anything like that? Any, any roadblocks? I'll start. We have not had roadblocks. Um, so we um, we start with the blood-based genomics in every patient and then reflex to tissue. And um, whether we end up starting to do both of those all the time, because I think there's probably value in knowing what co-mutations are, not just the driver mutations. Probably maybe that's going to become more and more clear in the next year or two. Uh, but nonetheless, um, we have not run into any reimbursement issues with that. Yeah, I, I would say that in in, in general, um, you know, what one of the things that we're most worried about is is uh, significant bills hitting our patients um, downstream of of these, and that's a major concern. The financial toxicity that goes along with that. Um, I, I would say that in general, though, that's not what we see, um, fortunately. Yeah, I mean, we we've gone out of our way to work with companies who will make sure that our patients aren't drown under these bills and sent to collections and things like that. And that's actually the only people that, that we'll work with um, that, are, that are open to those kind of things, especially nowadays. Um, that's a key. We also have um, a financial uh, navigator uh, in our cancer program as well uh, that's helpful for anything from getting biomarker testing paid to getting transportation for patients and, and things like that to really help them uh, with the financial pathway. Um, so one last question, and then we'll kind of wrap this up. Um, this question could be maybe open to interpretation. I'm not sure exactly what they meant, but how, how do they prevent attrition of their patients? Um, and, and I don't know if they mean they're leaving and going to another center. How do they keep them there, which is a huge problem. In a lot of communities, they want to keep their patients there. And honestly, patients want to stay there. Um, so how do they keep them there? And at what point maybe should they go somewhere else? Dr. Clark? Um, I, yeah, I, um, so it, it's a, uh, you know, complicated question. I think it's, 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 it's patient dependent and, and we, we have this discussion every, every day with our patients as far as, uh, some of them are coming from three hours away to see you and they're trying to decide, um, should they continue traveling that three hours or, or stay, you know, closer to home or, or, um, you know, likewise, I may be trying to send my patients uh, to another institution where there's a trial option or, or things like that. I would say that it's, uh, in the end, it's a patient-centered discussion and, and decision, trying to educate them on what you can offer that's in their best interest versus what's best for them at another institution. There's plenty of things that we may not have at Duke. Um, there's plenty of things that people can get closer to home, and I'm very upfront with them that I feel comfortable with this or that. Uh, closer to home for you, or I really think you should come here and see one of our interventional pulmonologists. Had a discussion like that today uh, with with a patient. Yeah, you know the how I kind of um, understood that question was a little bit different. I kind of understood it to mean um, a reference to that slide that Dr. Clark presented, where they show where he showed the patient that started out in every step along the way, people dropped out and didn't get therapy, right? And so. Um, if that's what the person meant by that question, I would say that, um, well, the biggest shame in all of it is if you look at the national statistics for getting people into their meaningful treatment, it's like 70 to 150 days, depending on what you're reading, right? So it's the average is terrible, right? And that's like, I'd probably drop out too. I'd lose interest after 120 days for sure, you know? And so, um, so I think one of the things um, is getting people through the system quick right, getting all the information up front. So that's what I was alluding to before. Like my job as a pulmonologist is to make sure when Dr. Clark sees the patient, the PET scan's done, the brain MRI's done, blood-based genomics is done. We've already had the conversation with pathology to reflex to tissue-based testing and PDL one testing. So all that's at least cooking. Um, and then the patient's presented in the multidisciplinary tumor board. So then when the patient sits down with Dr. Clark, they can have a meaningful discussion and say, hey, this is likely what's going to happen instead of, hey, oh, shoot, we need to order the PET scan. And then I come back, oh, now we have to get the brain MRI, you know, and like that type of thing. And I think you lose a ton of patience with that approach. Yeah, I think that's a great way to interpret that question as well. And 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 so I, I've said the same thing. I, and since this is kind of a talk for Society for Advanced Bronchoscopy, bear with me here for a second, Dr. Clark. Like. I, I want to push more people to kind of do that testing upstream 
if they know what they're doing. Um, and if they work closely with their pathologists, molecular pathologists, and their oncologists, we have a, a quarterly, we call it our molecular task force because it stuff changes constantly, right? So we sit down with the interested parties and we say, all right, how are we going to do this? Do we need to change? Are there any clinical trials that we have going on now that we need to alter this and maybe maybe check a stage one for, for things like that? So we're, we're doing that together uh, and that's an important part. So, you know, I just remember being at an ad board with all these oncologists, which already kind of made me feel uncomfortable and out of place. But I said exactly what you said, Dr. Skibo. I said, it's my job, at least I view it as my job, to hand them off to my oncologist with everything done. Staging, pdl one's been ordered. It, I mean, I have the result yet, but pdl one has been ordered, NGS has been ordered, and everything else. And JAWS just dropped in there. Like, that's just such an abnormal thing for them to hear. And that's part of what I want to change. Um, it, you know, it, but again, it doesn't have to be everywhere. Have that molecular task force talk at your institution. Find out how you can help them out. At some institutions, we've heard from at these ad boards, uh, it's all about the molecular pathologist. They're like, yeah, we're in charge of this. We order everything. Well, most places don't have a molecular pathologist. Anything to add there, Dr. Clark, and, and then we'll close it up. Yeah, I, I would just say, you know, first of all, I, I do think that that's uh, that was the intent of the question. I, I would say that both of you hit the nail on the head. Uh, with the, with the response, T um, time to diagnosis and time to treatment for lung cancer is is a major problem um, across the country. And so finding ways at the you know at the uh, institution level, at the societal level, to uh, shorten those those time intervals and um, uh, is is you know really very much uh, needed. And and I, I love the idea of just having everything in a in a package in a bow. Uh, uh, for the medical oncologist ready to, you know, provide the best treatment possible for the, for the patient. Yeah. All right. We can go to the next slide, which is kind of the goodbye slide. Um, I really appreciate this discussion. I, I wish we could do this for, for even longer because there's such great questions and these panel discussions and interactions are, are really fun to have. And I greatly appreciate you guys taking the time to do this with us tonight. Um, uh, this webinar it has been recorded. We'll put this on the SAB website, uh, which is uh, sabronchoscopy.org. Uh, please feel free to log on, share it with your friends. And um, we really appreciate this. Be safe, everybody, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.